All right, let's look, let's start with this here uh, automatic transmission test three. This is some basic. You got your your uh, really good information about uh, your spool valves and pressure regulator valves and pumps and all that kind of stuff from that little bit of videos. But I've got a. If you want to review that and look at the rest of the videos that we didn't catch, you can do that too. It's pretty good stuff. Doesn't take long to watch them. Uh, let's look at these true false questions here. Force is measured in pounds per square inch. Well, what's that measured in? Okay, what about pressure is measured in kilopascals? That's true, isn't it? That is true. What's a, what's a kilopascal? Is that a thousandth of a pascal? All right. Okay, in a hydraulic system, an increase in force means an increase in speed and distance. Well, an increase in force just means an increase in force, right? Without a functioning vent, a pump can't circulate transmission fluid from the reservoir. Think about that. How many of you guys remember, huh? Well, it, it can't pull it out of there. Like if you've got a, um, if you, let's say that I got one of those uh, water bottles and I drilled a hole in it and I put a straw in there that was really, really tight fitting into that hole. Right, and you got the cap screwed on the bottle really tight, and you start trying to draw that um, fluid out of that bottle, you know, just drinking it, drinking the water, whatever. So, what's going to happen if you don't have a vent? It's going to cave the bottle in, you ain't going to get it out of there. You need atmospheric pressure acting on the fluid to pull it out. I mean, actually, whenever you drink out of a, a, a cup of uh, tea or whatever that you get from the restaurant, it's atmospheric pressure pushing on the surface of that liquid that causes the fluid to go to your mouth. You start out with your mouth, the, the cavity in your mouth small, and you increase the size of it, and that causes a pressure differential that causes the stuff to go into your mouth. Most We don't think about it, we just do it. You know, Ever since you first were born, you've learned how to suck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's just basically the way it's done. You start with a small cavity, and you make the cavity bigger, and you, you know pressure differential causes it to flow. And that's pretty much the way uh, pumps and stuff work. Uh, all pumps removed for service require a visual inspection. No, excuse me. Pumps create fluid pressure. Is that true or false? Yeah. False. <laughs> they don't create fluid pressure. You cannot have fluid pressure unless you've got a restriction. You, you can have flow, but you won't have pressure. You got me? And so that's why you have to have a pressure regulator valve or an oil pump. Get this. If you've got uh, this one guy that I knew that was teaching over there at a another college or another automotive. It wasn't Steve, it was a different place. It was, you know, up north. Uh, he had an a engine that he was he rebuilt because it had no oil pressure, right? No oil pressure at all. And so he put a new oil pump on it, and it was a 3.8, like the one in this uh, car you're getting ready to pull the transmission out of out there. You know that one that y'all are working on that did you and uh, Johnny are going to pull the transmission out of? Okay, so uh, he rebuilt the engine because it had starved for oil, and he put brand new bearings and all that kind of stuff in it. And he put it all back together and with a new oil pump now. no going And he cranked it up and it still didn't have any oil pressure. And he burned it up the second time. And he had taken it back apart. And he goes, I just don't understand this. And I says, do you know where the pressure relief valve is for the oil pump? He says, well, I don't know. I thought it was in the oil pump. And I said, not on this car. On, the, on this car, the pressure relief valve's in the timing cover. And I says, now look, so we got the timing cover, we flipped it over, the pressure relief valve was stuck open. Now if the pump had produced pressure, he wouldn't have needed the pressure relief valve, right? So the pressure relief valve actually, when that pump pre starts pushing fluid against that pressure relief valve, the spring on that pressure relief valve has to be squeezed in order to let that, you know, pressure go back to the sump. So if you don't have a, like if the spring breaks on the pressure relief valve, the pump will have flow, but there'll be no pressure there. That's the point. So you're going to have to have something to restrict that so that pressure will build. Think of yourself putting um, your thumb over the end of the water hose and the water hose gets tight. See, you're, you're actually regulating the pressure with your thumb, right? Got it? Okay. Uh, all pumps removed for service require a visual inspection. That's true. You really need to take the pump apart and make sure that it's okay. Most valves in an automatic transmission are check valves. Is that true or false? That's false, false. isn't it? 
you understand the different kind of valves. You got spool valves, you got ball valves, and then you got a little thermal valves. Thermal valves are really, they don't are used very much, but that is a valve that needed to be uh, covered in there. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, lens, valleys, face, and spring are all parts of a typical spool valve, right? Sure. That's true. A gyrotor pump may have a constant displacement or variable displacement. False. False, because what kind has a variable displacement? Vane. Vane. See how good that video was? It, it just burns you in on this, right? Uh, valence valve can be controlled by hydraulic pressure, spring pressure, or both. That's true. Which of the following is not an advantage of using hydraulics? A, flexibility. B, force multiplication. C, high pressure. Or D, simplicity. D. What about C? That's not an advantage. Hydraulics uh, have high pressure, and whenever you got high pressure, you got to be able to contain that high pressure, right? Okay, uh, which of the following statements is true about a remote cylinder with a piston surface area half the size of the input piston? Uh, that's number 12. It travels twice the distance of the input piston, right? We talked about Pascal's law last week. Which of the following statements is not true about a remote cylinder with a piston surface area twice the size of the input piston? In, now, remote cylinder, which is going to be out there, piston surface twice the size of the input piston. What does it do? What, what do you got? What you got? 13 is what? which is not true about a remote cylinder. Does it travel twice as far? You got, you got to move the input piston twice as far in order to move the output piston half as far. This is one of those, it's like an ASC question that sometimes they'll say, all of the following is true except, and you got to pay attention to that word except because you'll get it wrong if you're not careful. I tell you how I get messed up sometimes on an ASC test or some other kind of a test is multiple choice. I have a tendency to read that question and machine gun through those answers and I'll see the first answer I see that's right, I'll pick it. And if it's an all of the above, you'll miss one of those. <laughs> you see where I'm going? So pay attention to make sure that the last one's not all of the above before you... Uh, the most common types of automatic transmission pump is what? That would, no, that'd be the gear pump. The gear pump is more, more common than that. Uh, all right, flip over... Uh, you guys have just got, you don't have any matching questions, do you? Well, we got to do I know, but I mean, do you have matching questions? No. Okay, that's good. Because uh, on the key or something. Which of the following valves is used in automatic transmission controls the direction of fluid flow? Fluid flow. Check valve. Switching valve. You know the one that where the little ball is moving back and forth? Mm -hmm. That's a switching valve. Right. You got it. Okay. Now then. Uh, let's look at number automatic transmission test four. Uh, a transmission uses a governor to sense road speed. You get? Did you pick that up? Isn't that true? Yep, that is true. Uh, brief story. I was working at the Lincoln Mercury place in 1984. I had an escort that came in there with a little governor, just like we saw in the video, the little plastic gear on the governor spinning the thing. And they said the transmission won't shift. This thing belonged to Ford Motor Credit. It didn't hardly have any miles on it. And so I said, okay, so I pulled the governor out and, you know, just, it was, the gear, you know, everything was moving right. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to anything other than the, will these centrifugal things, fly weights move and will the, all that was fine, you know, and I didn't see anything that jumped out and grabbed me about the gear. And so I threw it aside and threw another governor in it, drove the car, it shifted fine. And I said, okay, that's good. A week later, it was back with the same problem. Well, the gear is a tall, a long, skinny thing. It's about as big around as your little finger. And... As I dragged my finger across it, I noticed in the center it had a sort of an hourglass shape, and the newer governor, the new governor, the other new governor didn't have that. And I said, this thing has actually worn its teeth off. So I pulled the pan, and you could see that drive gear that was on the final drive, and that plastic drive gear that was meshing with the governor gear, and it was also meshing with the vehicle, uh, I mean the speedometer cable gear. That gear was dancing around loose on there, which it needed to be tight. And so I had to pull the final drive out of there, press a bearing off, put a new plastic gear on there. And I put a shim stock on that underneath that sucker and put it where it would be really, really tight to make sure it would get loose again. Uh, but anyway, it was, uh, that was like a six hour flag and I did it about an hour and a half. But because of the fact that I wrestled that thing out of there and the service manager says, this says it pays six hours and you got through that awfully quick. And I said, yeah, I know the book says you got to pull the, the transmission, but I did it without pulling the transmission and I don't want to be penalized for that. You know, I got the truck, I got the car fixed. That was the point, and I did it right. So anyway, that was a, the, 
it that was one of those things where I said, huh, I didn't look at the governor close enough to recognize the gear was worn out, so I had to go back, I had to come back. See what I'm saying? I just figured, through a governor and it works okay, you think you're done, right? But I didn't investigate what caused the problem to begin with. That was a problem. Okay. Um, mainline pressure is the source from which governor and throttle pressures are produced. That's true. As the engine load decreases, throttle pressure increases. Huh? That's false. That's right. When you let off the gas, it goes down. Let me tell you something else. I've said this before the other day. If you leave that throttle cable disconnected so that it doesn't know that you're deep into the throttle, you will burn that transmission up. It's a very easy and simple mistake to make. Or let's say you don't put the little clip in there good and the thing pops off while they're driving it and they come back and that transmission is toast and you're the one that worked on it and they can see that you left that loose or didn't put it on right. And the shop that you work at is going to have to buy a transmission overall and that ain't smart. Make doggone sure you connect that throttle valve cable if it's got one. If it ain't got one and it's using MAP and all that, then you're pretty much looking at electronic stuff going on there. But throttle position sensor and all is used on the newer ones. But I've seen those things be left off by somebody and they dry and they burn the transmission up. You know, and it will burn it up. Because if the throttle pressure doesn't go up and it's, the clutches are slipping, you know, because you're deep into the throttle and all that, just make sure you understand that. Um, as the speed of the vehicle increases, governor pressure rises. Is that right? Is that correct? You got that? Okay, most mechanically operated throttle valves will automatically adjust their cells using a vacuum modulator. That's totally backwards. What's the vacuum modulator do? The vacuum modulator is using engine vacuum to move a valve with a diaphragm. The deeper into the throttle you are, the lower your engine vacuum is, the greater your engine load. If you put one back together, somebody's got one with a modulator valve on it. And this old mobile we got's got one that the Cadillac had one. You remember that vacuum valve? If you leave that unhooked, it won't shift until it's getting really fat because it thinks you're a wide open throttle. And so what happened with that unhooked? Boom! Now Chrysler never used a modulator valve. They used throttle valve on everything. And they had a spring that was supposed to hold that thing forward. And if you left the spring off, it would be back like it was at high pressure all the time. And it would slam whenever you shifted. And if it's slamming when you shift, so you don't have the propensity to burn one up on one of those. If it's laying back all the time, the pressure's high, and that's, the good, that's a good default. As a matter of fact, electronic transmissions, if they detect a little slippage, like if it knows that it's not supposed to be slipping, because I've locked the torque converter clutch up, I'm in direct, I know what this, if I'm detecting a little slippage, it's going to say, whoops, I've got a problem, because it's electronically controlled, I'm jacking the pressure way up, and I'm flashing a an overdrive light. And you're going, I'm flashing an overdrive light, and I'm going boom, and I'm hitting really hard. That's not a big deal because it's protecting itself. When it slams those clutches in there with high pressure, they're not going to slip and burn up. You got me? But I mean, it's pretty hair raising for somebody that's not used to the transmission shifting hard. Wham, you know, and all this. Okay, so, oh, incidentally, let me tell you one more little thing. A lot of the transmissions uh, that are controlled by the powertrain control module, uh, it's not unusual if you can watch this thing uh, and it's really difficult to see it if you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, the transmission, as the transmission shifts, if they don't want you to feel those shifts all that strong, some of the powertrain control modules are smart enough that right at the moment when the transmission is shifting, it detorques the engine so that you won't feel it and also so that it'll be less likely to slip the clutch. I mean, the clutch is in there. Got me? You understand what I'm saying? Detorquing the engine means it's going to rob a little torque from you at that moment because you don't need torque when you're in the middle of a shift. And a lot of times you may not even really feel a shift. You may see that seat on your tack, but you may not feel it. And see, that's what their whole deal is right there. Yeah, so that's exactly similar to what it's doing, you know. Okay, uh, now then, um, oh, let's, uh, let me see what she's wanting here. She may have us a Volkswagen stuff going on here. Okay, talk to me. Yeah, yep. That's me. Yep. Right? It's non-turbo. It's got all them heater. No, it's uh, it's got all them heater hoses going through it. It carries water, and it's, it's got a seal. It's sealed with a little O-ring, but this one here is deteriorating. It's leaking coolant. It's on the driver's end of the cylinder head on this 2005 VW Beetle. Uh, well, what do you mean front or rear? It's on the it's on the end of it. Yeah, it's on the opposite end. It's on the transaxle end, which would be the driver's end. You know. The timing belt's on the opposite end of the head. Got me? 
and it's got several hoses that hook to it. Got some big ones, some small, some heater hose size, and some that are you know like inch and a quarter and that kind of thing. And yeah, scare them up. All right, trying to get a part for us. Okay, now then, um, where are we at here? What's the one? Where are we at? Which question? Six. Huh? Six. Six. A typical four-speed automatic transmission has three shifts valves. True or false? That's actually true, by the way. Well, I'll tell you something else. If you're monitoring the shift solenoids on an automatic transmission, and it's got shift solenoid A, B, and C, in your mind, just like in mine, when I first saw shift solenoids, you're going to think, when shift solenoid A is energized, we'll be shifting from first to second. When B is energized, we'll be shifting from second to third. When C is, you know what I'm saying? You're thinking that way. I thought that way, but that ain't right. Those shift solenoids are all over the place. You know, you may have all of them dark, two of them lit up, one up, and there's no rhyme or reason in your mind, you know, A, B, and C doesn't give you one, two, and three. You got me? I mean, they're just everywhere. But so that's why you have a chart in your automatic transmission you know, thing is telling you when you're in drive in first gear, these solenoids are off and these solenoids are on. So you'll have a little matrix there. With the, on the left, you'll have your gear ranges, and across the top, you'll have what the solenoids are doing. You've also got another one of those, and you need to be looking into this. That'll tell you which clutches are applied in you know various different gears. Like if you're in drive and it's in second gear and it's shifting up, it'll tell you this clutch is applied, this one's released, this one's holding, this one's whatever. Got me? So you need to, if you're, this is the reason this is important, is when you're got, let's say that you get in an automatic, a car with automatic transmission, and second gear is, is acting wacky, or you're not going into second gear, or something crazy like that. You can look at those charts, which solenoids are energized in second gear, which components are holding in second gear, you got me? So then when you tear the transmission down, all you check your pressures too. So you know what your pressure, if your pressures don't look right. Like if your pressure drops when it's supposed to be in seconds, you know you got something leaking pressure in there. You see what I'm saying? That's, it, that's the way it goes. Now, i got a brief little story here. Uh, if I can, if some of y'all don't turn into a skeleton, listen to me tell these stories. Girl comes over here, and I may have, some of you may have heard it. She's driving this 2007, she's actually a, 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 a former student's cousin. So she comes over here, and she's driving this 2007 Hyundai Santa Fe, I think it was, or we you know the old SUV. I can't remember which one. It might have been a Tucson. Long and the short of it was, she says, this thing, uh, if, unless I feather the throttle when I'm going up through my gears, this thing slam shifts from, you know, whenever, and just bang, it's about jerking crick in your neck. But I can feather the throttle and it shifts pretty good. And so I'm already thinking when she tells me this, this thing can shift under the right circumstances the way it should. So I plug in the Maxi DOS in there. And I'm watching it shift, and you know, I go to the in through that, I'm watching the transmission shift. It jumps from uh, second to fourth without ever touching third when she's doing this. And it goes BAM, you know, when it does that. Well, I, she's driving it, she's used to driving it, feathering her throttle. And I said, okay, well, let's pull over here for a second. And this is one of the things that I was telling Melissa about this other day. I says, okay, switch the car off. Ooh, you know. Okay, and when I said turn it back on, I meant switch on the key, but she started it back up. I said, no, no, don't start it back up. Switch it on. <laughs> I just said turn the key on. It's a communication issue there, you know. I said, turn the key on. I said, all right. And I went in there and I looked around and it said, reset transmission adaptive learning tables. I said, well, it won't cost anything to do that. So, <laughs> And I said, oh, let's try that. So I went, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, I'm sure I want to do this. Broom. Tables reset. She didn't know what I was doing. She was looking at the screen, but she didn't have a clue. I said, okay, I'm backing out of this routine. Crank it up. Let's drive it again. So we took off down the road. I said, I want you to try to make it shift just as hard as it will. Just stay in it and see if it'll slam us again. You know. So she drove it and drove it and drove it. She goes, this won't ever shift bad again now. I said, do you suppose we fixed it when we reset those tables? And she went, she says, now I can take this $1,600 I've been saving to buy a transmission and spend it on something else. <laughs> it was electronic. It was an electronic fix. Yeah, you know, she, just if huh? she had uh, swapped out the transmissions, would it still done the same thing? She would have had the battery cable off. Now she could have probably dumped the battery cable and put it back on. Let learn from this, guys. If somebody says this thing's shifting horrible and then blah blah, say let's just take the battery cables off and let it forget what it knows, because it's all got an adaptive learning cycle. Mm -hmm. Let's let's dump the memory and leave it off for 10, 15, 20 minutes, or maybe, or maybe take both the battery cables off and touch them together. So that it bleeds. I'm not talking about touch the battery together, but touch the cables together. Put it back on and see if it shifts normally. Because sometimes you'll just reboot your transmission computer and it'll work right. You got me? It's like rebooting your PC, man. Mm -hmm. And also make darn sure that you ain't got no blown fuses, like I told you the other day, you know. 
Like when I told that girl's daddy, I said, she, you know, she says, uh, my transmission won't shift. I said, check your fuses. He goes, oh, it's the stupidest fool thing I ever heard. Well, she found out she had a blown fuse. It worked great. You know, and he was just totally flabbergasted. And that was an old Grand M, like a 94 model. It's older than yours. But, okay, let's look at here. Um, where are we headed? Seven. Seven? Uh, now I'm now sick. Okay, uh, electronic governor provides the same functions as a check ball and control valve governor. It does. An improper adjustment on a me mechanically operated TV system will result in late hard shifts or soft slipping shifts. That's true. Um, here's another thing. You're going to be looking on some vehicles, particularly Chrysler's. You can actually go in there and you can look. If you're trying to determine if you've got a problem that has been showing up on the Chrysler, look for clutch volume index. Clutch volume index is going to tell you how much trouble it has had applying certain clutches. Now, Chrysler is the only people that do that. But you go look at clutch volume index, you see a really high number on one of those clutches, you know you got a problem in that transmission. You got me? If your CVI number is really high and that one, all of them are you know, running 50 or 60 or whatever and one of them running 119 or 122, that means it's had to really work hard to apply that clutch. So it keeps track of that for you, so it's really a good thing. Looking at your scan tool and poking around. Also, look at your target governor pressure. If it's electronically controlled on a Jeep or a Dodge, look at your target governor pressure. If it's shooting for 120 PSI and you're only seeing 60, that's a problem. Anytime your target and your actual don't match, that's when you're going to be digging for something. Now, sometimes you may have a bad transducer reporting the pressure wrong. Sometimes it may have a, bear, a bad solenoid, variable force solenoid, not able to control the pressure. But that's up to you to figure out how to do that, but you can make it happen. All right, now then, let's see... Um, an engine, at engine idle, the maximum current flows through the pressure control solenoid. That is actually true. What are we wanting to do? If, we want, if we're going to default something, we're going to default it to the place where it's not going to tear something up or where it's going to be safe. Uh, for your air conditioning uh, use, how many of you guys have ever driven one that the vacuum lines were unhooked feeding the air conditioners blowing out the defrost all the time? You seen that? You seen that before? That's a safety thing. The reason they do that is if something malfunctions, they want you to be able to see where you're going. So they want them blowing on the windshield, right? That's really that's one of the most important parts of that. Because you don't have to find something and wipe it off, you know. All right, secondly, if I'm going to, what I tell you about the high pressure, the high pressure is going to make the clutches apply harder. So what we're going to do is, if we lose power to our pressure control solenoid, which way do we want the pressure to go? If we lose power, if something happens, and you know, let's say a, a, a rat jumps up there and bites some wires in two, and we crank it up the next morning, which way do we want that pressure to go? Remember what I told you about the throttle valve? That's like having your dead gum throttle valve unhook, except we can actually make it so the pressure goes high if we've lost pressure to the pressure control solenoid. That's a good thing. Shifting hard, we got a light flashing, but we're not burning up clutches. Got me? I'd rather it shift hard. I'd rather it shift firm than soft myself. Because you're going to have more life out of your transmission if it's shifting firm. That's what a shift kit does, you know. You put some strength, bam, makes it shift harder. Okay, so basically on number nine, uh, if the minimum current is flowing, right, you got that? That's actually, actually going to be true. But if the minimum current is flowing through the pressure control solenoid, you're basically going to have uh, high pressure. You want low pressure at idle, though. A solenoid that fails mechanically can fail in either the open or closed position. Uh, well, oh, mm, yeah. Well, actually, uh, whenever the solenoid is energized, it's actually stopped up its. It, in other words, if you're blowing through the solenoid and you energize it, it goes, thump, and you can't blow through it. When you de energize it, it opens back up. Now, occasionally, and you got to have, if you go to a place where they do transmissions habitually all the time, you're going to see a surgically clean workbench where there's not a speck of nothing. And they're going to be really, really careful about what kind of cloths and everything they use because one tiny little piece of thread can get in there and cause a valve to stick. One tiny little piece of grit. I mean, you can't, it's got to be just about microscopically clean in there. Of course, when you see, you know, students over here tearing automatic transmissions down, there's dirt everywhere. Before you turn an automatic transmission down, steam clean the darn thing and get it as clean as you can. You know what I mean? It's got to be really, 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 really clean. And you guys are going to tear a transmission down if you do what you're supposed to while you're here. Is the, the blank is critical to diagnosing shift fill timing or slippage complaints? 
modulator adjustment check, diaphragm vacuum leakage test, vacuum supply and response test, diaphragm leakage visual test. This is basically when they're talking about modulator valves, and that's going to be C, vacuum supply and response test. What's response test mean? I'm going to get my vacuum gauge, and I'm going to snap the throttle, and I'm going to see if that needle operates really fast. Because if I've got some jelly or some crud partially stopping up that vacuum line and I give it the gas and the vacuum doesn't respond rapidly, then the transmission is not going to work right, is it? Also, if you've got an underpowered engine, because the engine is just not pull like the timings on the engine is off or something, what are you going to have to do to pick up the same speed? You're going to have to go deeper into the throttle, aren't you? If you go deeper into the throttle, what are you going to do? Your shifts are going to happen later and harder. So just because your shifts are happening later and harder doesn't mean there's something wrong with the transmission. You need to see if there's something going on with the engine. The engine's got to have the right amount of power first. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. If your engine is weak, your transmission's going to shift late and hard. Don't go after the transmission until you're sure the engine's running right, big time. And your catalytic converter or something can cause that. You got me? Okay, we just got a very few minutes here to go, so stick with me. Which of the following is not a characteristic of electronic pressure control? A, pressure changes are instantly made when... Uh, required. B, adjustments are needed frequently. Let's stop right there. You don't need to adjust that. The function of the throttle valve is to do what? A, control the timing of upshifts and downshifts. B, adjust the output volume of the hydraulic pump. Let's just, uh, what do you think? Uh, that's number, uh, respond to the engine load by shifting the transmission to higher or lower gear. That's what the right answer to that one is. Which of the following statements is true about vacuum throttle valve systems? At engine idle, manifold vacuum is low. Is that true? What is it, guys? Come on, 18 to 22 inches at idle, right? Which is high. Uh, if the throttle open, manifold vacuum rises. Is that true? No, that's backwards. At wide open throttle, manifold vacuum is very low. That is the correct answer. All of the above is not the correct answer, right? And finally, question number 15, and everybody is really, really happy because this is the last one. With a solenoid control shift valve, the one, two solenoid controls what? What is it? What did you say? Do, do your military. What is it? Are you saying Baker or Delta? Delta. Oh, Delta. Uh, actually, the one, two, and three, four up shifts and the four, three, and two, one down shifts is the right answer on that one. See how easy that stuff is to understand? All right. Now what you're going to do is uh, burn this stuff in and get serious about this automatic transmission stuff because uh, you guys are all supposed to be experts by the time you leave here at the end of July, right? You got it? Yeah.